on Facebook. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. We are connecting our Zoom and Facebook feeds. We'll get started in just a few moments. And we are all connected. Take it away, Anita. Welcome, everybody. My name is Anita Kassoff, and I am the director of the Baltimore Museum of Industry. We are delighted to be partnering with the Enoch Pratt Free Library to bring you tonight's discussion with Alec McGillis and Jesse Holland. I am especially pleased that we'll be hearing from Alec tonight because fulfillment is, in a sense, the next chapter of the Baltimore Museum of Industry's Bethlehem Steel Legacy Project. This multi-year initiative aims to preserve, document, and tell the story of Bethlehem Steel and the people who worked at its Sparrows Point Mill in Baltimore. As you'll learn, the mill's former site has been transformed into a logistics and distribution hub, and its anchor tenant is Amazon. One of the questions that our Bethlehem Steel Project explores is what the human costs are when manufacturing jobs disappear. Alex's book, provi book provides some answers. Programs like tonight are made possible thanks to the generosity of people like you who support Baltimore's museums, libraries, and cultural institutions. If you'd like to find out more about becoming a member of Baltimore Museum of Industry, I encourage you to visit our website, www.thebmi.org. On our website, you'll find more information about virtual programs and in-person activities, such as our Saturday Farmer's Market, as well as news of our grand reopening on July 3rd. I hope you'll check us out and get involved. And now it is my pleasure to turn things over to Kelly Shimabukoro. Thank you, Anita. We're grateful for the Baltimore Museum of Industry's continued collaboration. Welcome friends from near and far. I'm Kelly Shimabukuro, Chief of Programs and Outreach at the Enoch Pratt Free Library. Thank you for joining us for a special Writers Live with Alec McGillis. All Pratt Library locations are open at 50% capacity for limited services, including browsing and the computer use. If you're in Baltimore, we hope you'll come and visit. When you visit, join us in Summer Break Baltimore. You'll get a Summer Break Baltimore box filled with prizes and books just for signing up. The program will also include a virtual and outdoor programs, as well as weekly prize drawings for participants. You can find out more about it at our website, prattlibrary.org. Before introduction, some virtual logistics. If you're watching in Zoom, please use the chat to post questions. If you're watching on Facebook, please post in the comments. A survey will be posted near the end of the program. Your feedback helps us serve you. Today, we are thrilled to host host I'm sorry, <clears throat> excuse me. We are thrilled to host Alec McGillis in conversation with Jesse J. Holland. Support our local bookstore partner, the Ivy Bookshop, and order your copy of Fulfillment, Winning and Losing in One Click America directly from them. My colleague will post a link to purchase Fulfillment from the Ivy Bookshop's website in the chat. Alec McGillis is a senior reporter at ProPublica. McGillis previously reported for the New Republic, the Washington Post, and the Baltimore Sun. He won the 2016 Robin Toner Prize for Excellence in Political Reporting, the 2017 Polk Award for National Reporting, and the 2017 Elijah Parrish Lovejoy Award. His work has appeared in The New Yorker, Atlantic, New York, Harper's, and New York Times Magazines, among other publications. A resident of Baltimore, McGillis is the author of The Cynic, a 2014 biography of Senator Mitch McConnell, and the forthcoming fulfillment, Winning and Losing in One Click America. Jesse J. Holland is an award-winning writer, journalist, and television personality. Jesse is host of the Saturday edition of C-SPAN's Washington Journal and can be seen weekly as a political analyst on the Black News channels, DC Live, and occasionally on CNN, MSNBC, Fox News, and other news outlets for news and analysis. He is the author and editor of The New Black Panther, Tales of Wakanda Prose and Anthology, released in February 2021 from Titan Books and Marvel. 
the first prose anthology featuring the first mainstream black superhero. He is also the author of The Black Panther, Who is the Black Panther? Prose novel, which was nominated for an NAACP Image Award in 2019 and The Invisibles, the untold story of African-American slavery inside the White House, which was named the 2017 Silver Medal Award winner in US history in the Independent Publisher Book Awards and one of the top history books of 2016 by Smithsonian.com. Jesse also wrote Star Wars, The Force Awakens, Finn's story, it's a young adult novel and the black men built the Capitol discovering African-American history in and around Washington, DC. Please give a warm virtual welcome to Alec McGillis and Jesse J. Holland. Thank you so much, Kelly, for that great introduction. Thank you as well to Anita. And we want to give a special thanks to the Pratt Free Library for this great conversation tonight. And welcome to all of you who are watching us virtually or on Facebook Live. Remember, if you have questions for Alec, you can put them in the chat on Zoom or you can put it in the discussion, the uh, comments section on Facebook Live. We're go Alec and I will are going to have a chat, but as we go through, I will work in some of your questions about Alec's career, this great book, Fulfillment. If you don't have your copy, go get it right now. It's a great book. And so let's welcome Alex to the conversation. Alec, how you doing, man? You're doing great, Jesse. Thanks so much for, for being here with us. No, thank you for this great book, Fulfillment. Now, as writers, we always start at the beginning. So tell us, first of all, how did you come up with the idea for Fulfillment? Thank you, Jesse. And I should just also quickly say a thank you to the sponsors tonight. Um, this event is so meaningful for me, um, both because the book really kind of started in Baltimore, but also because I care so much about these institutions that are hosting tonight. Um, the the uh, museum of industry had a terrific event a year or two ago with my friend Joe Giordano showing some photographs of Beth Steele that were really kind of a big inspiration for me as I was doing the book. And then the library, my gosh, um, some of my best times working in the book were spent at the library up in the Maryland room going through the incredible archives there, the incredible clip files on, on Sparrows Point. Uh, and I should also, also note that the, that the entire first chapter of my book, which is not about Baltimore, but about, but about Seattle, was shaped partly because when I was going through the uh, just the stacks at the Pratt, I came across, I stumbled across a pretty obscure history book of, about Black Seattle, the history of Black Seattle. And I was already thinking about focusing my Seattle chapter on that community in Seattle. But when I saw that book sitting there, um, I thought this was a sign to, to, to go in that direction. And it's all because of the Pratt. This is such an extraordinarily valuable institution. I'm so glad it's back open. Uh, and thank you to you, to you, Jesse, for, for being part of this tonight. One of my best discussions about writing um, and Baltimore was with, with you at Goucher a few years ago. So I'm really glad you could uh, take part in this. Um, so with this book, as I said, started here in Baltimore um, in, in this sense. The book is not really, the, book's, the book is, is often described as a book about Amazon, but it actually began not about Amazon at all. The book started in my growing concern as a reporter going around the country um, growing, growing increasingly concerned about the disparities in America, the growing disparities between winner-take-all cities like DC, Seattle, San Francisco, Boston, New York, a few others, and a much larger group of sort of left-behind cities and towns. That gap has been growing wider and wider. Um, it's gotten bigger than it ever has before. And I, starting back in like 2008 or so, when I was a national reporter for the Washington Post, covering the Obama campaign, covering um, the Great Recession, I would go out to the Midwest, to Appalachia, other places, and just be struck by how, how much a lot of these towns cities were struggling. Then I'd come back to Washington and where I was living at the time and just be overwhelmed by the prosperity and complacency and disconnect on display in Washington, just a completely different universe. And it really bothered me. And then I moved back to Baltimore um, with my family in 2013. Um, I'd been here before as a Sun reporter. And and it just struck me all over again, just how these two cities that are only 40 miles apart could be so divergent in their, in their fortunes, in their trajectories. Um, and and, and just, just that, that you would have that such proximity, but then such incredible um, distance, the point where I felt like a kind of vertigo when I would travel back and forth between them. 
So I wanted to somehow write about this disparity, this growing disparity between these different sorts of places in America, which is not healthy for either sort of city. Um, and, and finally, after Trump got elected, I thought I need to write a book about this. This is now distorting our politics. Um, and I finally, after about a year, settled on Amazon as the frame for the story of these, this growing regional inequality. And the reason I chose Amazon is twofold. One, the company is so ubiquitous in our life now, just everywhere that it's in, in, our, in, our, in our daily life, in our country, that it serves as a good thread to kind of take you around the country to show you what we're becoming. It just it serves as a good metaphor in a way for who we are today. But then it's also a good frame for the story because it is itself contributing to this this regional inequality. One reason we have such incredible concentration of wealth in our country in certain places is that we have such concentration of our economy in certain companies, including Amazon. So that's how I came to, to Amazon as the frame. I, want, I was gonna tell a story, not of Amazon itself, but about Amazon's America, what, we're, what everything that sort of lies in the growing shadow of this company. You've already heard <laughs> the words regional inequality two or three times yeah. which seems to be the uh the crux of what we're you're writing about here so what regions are we talking about is this a north versus south is this west versus everybody else is this rural versus urban is this coastal elite versus heartland tell us the regions sure. that you're covering here and exactly what you discovered it's it's really all those different factors kind of rolled into one it's partly urban and rural, but it's also about the, the gaps between different kinds of cities. And it's mostly cities on the coast that are the winner take all cities. But of course, our own city, Baltimore, um, is, is, is also on the East Coast and, is, and definitely falls into the category of a left behind city. So the way I think of this is, is basically this. We've always, there's, there's actually ways to quantify this. We've always had richer and poorer places in this country, of course but the gap has just gotten much bigger than it has before. Just like the income gap on, our, on the income ladder between the 1% and the 99% has gotten much bigger than it ever has before. We used to, back in the 19, 1980, there was only small portions of our country that had median income that was 20% above the norm or greater or 20% below the norm or, or greater. Most of our country was kind of right around the middle. Only a few cities, DC and a few others were above the norm, 20% above or or higher, and then only a few parts of Appalachia on the Deep South were 20% below the norm or lower. Now, whole swaths of the country are 20% below the average, average income or lower, including pretty much the entire Midwest, entire Great Plains, um, then, then huge swaths of the country are now, strips of the country are, are much 20% above the norm or higher, most of the coasts, not including Baltimore. And another way of looking, of thinking about this, the, um, the this, I love this stat, the, tw the 20 wealthiest cities in the country back in the mid 60s uh, by median income included all sorts of cities in the Midwest, Cleveland, Milwaukee, Des Moines, Rockford, Illinois. Um, these now, now flash forward to, our, to right now, and there are virtually no cities in the interior of the country who, who are um, who make that cut, make that list. Almost all the wealthiest cities are on the coast. So what I chose to focus on the book are two winner-take-all cities and two left-behind places. The winner-take-all cities are Seattle, of course, as Amazon's headquarters, which has been utterly transformed by, by, by Amazon. And then the second one is Washington, D.C. And I actually chose Washington, D.C. even before Amazon itself chose Washington for the second headquarters. The two left-behind places I chose to focus on are Baltimore, um, where I live, which I care so deeply about because I wanted to get at that Baltimore-Washington divide and then, and then various cities and towns in Ohio where I've spent a lot of time as a reporter. So those are the, the two main pairs that I, that I chose to focus on. There are of course other places that I could have put in there as well. So what makes um, DC and Seattle the winners and what makes Baltimore and these cities in towns you were in Ohio, the loser. Is it Amazon or was it something before Amazon? It's, there are, there are of course, of course, larger forces at work, um, but Amazon is, is embodies them to, to an extraordinary degree. What is happening, what's been happening, you know, to put it, try to sort of put it briefly as succinctly is that in the tech economy, you end up that we are, 
the tech economy of today, you end up with a winner take all effect, a natural winner take all effect, because what happens is there's a there's this agglomerate, they call it the, the fancy word for it is an agglomerating effect, where there's this back in the old day of the manufacturing economy, if you came up with a given industrial innovation, like say the steel making process, the Bessemer steel making process, you could go set up a steel mill anywhere in the country, anywhere that you had some basic manpower, resource, natural resources and transportation, river or rail to get your, your product out. Now with the tech economy, there's such, so much of the value lies in the initial innovation um, of whatever it might be, whatever software or app it might be that you're, that you're coming up with. And so it's all about getting all those you know, great innovative minds together in proximity to come up with those innovations, getting them in, together in proximity with also with capital, with venture capital, um, where the thing gets made is almost immaterial, right? That the value does not lie in, in making that software. That, that's gonna go overseas somewhere. The actual, the real value lies in that initial, the initial innovation. So it's all about that human capital together and the human, human capital agglomerates. It, it's, you, there's this, you all wanna be in the place where, um, where this is happening. It's, it becomes very much kind of a clustering kind of effect. So you end up with something like a Silicon Valley or a Seattle. Amazon, Amazon goes to Seattle in the first place for two reasons. One, because of the tax, uh, tax advantages. It didn't want to be in California because that would have meant having to assess sales taxes on the biggest market in the country. And that would have deprived it of, of its biggest advantage against regular booksellers. But it also wanted to be in Seattle because Microsoft was already there. So you had this talented tech workforce that was already there that you, that you could draw off of. Similarly, the reason why Amazon now decides to go to Washington DC with it for its second headquarters is that you have this huge, highly educated workforce in DC, all those tech guys and women working at the, all the contractors, the IT contractors around the beltway. Um, there's another reason why Amazon goes to Washington, which we can get to, into later, but the main reason is that workforce. And so you end up with this winner take all effect where even though Washington is so expensive and so crowded already, you'd think they wouldn't want to go there, but they do go there because because they wanna be near that workforce. And what makes this all so especially kind of crazy is that it shouldn't matter that much where a given tech company decides to go. But in this case with Amazon, it matters so much because the company has gotten so big. The natural, natural agglomerating effect that I'm describing in the high tech industry is made sort of all the more extreme because we've let these companies get so big that where a given company decides to go has this incredibly outsized effect. Um, and, and that's where we are today. Where Washington, the decision to go to Washington is in right there in one fell swoop going to dramatically increase, further increase the gap between Washington, which is now the headquarters town where people, all these Amazon folks are gonna be making $150,000 a year on average. And there's gonna be this huge investment in this new fancy corporate campus in Arlington Whereas Baltimore is essentially the warehouse town. Baltimore now has four, four Amazon warehouses, three of them at Sparrows Point. Um, and in Baltimore, we have Amazon jobs, but they're different jobs. They're $15 an hour jobs in windowless warehouses out on the edge of town. So you end up with this complete bifurcation between the headquarters city and the warehouse town. Now, one of the things that I'm always interested in as an author myself is the title of the book. So the title of the book is Fulfillment. Tell us why this book is called Fulfillment. That title was with me from the very first day. I mean, I, I almost, it was almost, I, I was so strongly attached to the title that it almost became in another argument for, for using Amazon as the frame of the book. I, because I, I love the title because it has all these different resonances, right? These different meanings. It is the, it is the actual, phrase that Amazon uses to describe its warehouses. They are fulfillment centers because they are fulfilling your order. They're fulfilling your desire. Um, and, and that's just, that's a lot of the centers, including the first one in Baltimore, the one down on Broning Highway that used to be uh, the GM plant that actually says, uh, says on the outside of it, Amazon fulfillment, right? That's, it's, a, it's very much a, a, an Amazon term of art. But of course the word also has this other other resonance, uh, this, this sort of broader resonance of what it means to be fulfilled in life as a consumer, as a worker, um, how, how we all are constantly seeking purpose and meaning in our life. And, and what the book 
suggests or implies is that 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 search for fulfillment has has gotten more difficult for all of us, both as workers and also as citizens, as residents, um, because of this more sort of atomized kind of existence that and unequal existence that that has been that has been brought about. Now, one of the things that has been the um, greatest sticking point of the industrial age is the, the, the financial disparity between the factory owner, the factory supervisor, and the factory worker. Now, along comes Amazon mm -hmm. and its sort of new technological industrial age, where you, like you already said, you have the well-paid or millionaire owner, billionaire owner as far as Amazon, you have the highly paid executives, and then you have the $15 an hour warehouse jobs. Is that sort of the same disparity we saw that led to the rise of unions and led to a lot of, what shall we say, resentment between the people who made the thing and the people who own the factories? Absolutely. I mean, I just... I, I kept thinking about how we've kind of cycled back to this earlier moment in time, and especially in the context of Sparrow's Point, where you have this, you know, this peninsula that became home to the, the what was in the late 50s, of the largest steelworks in the world with 30,000 workers or so, that whole incredible company town there. And, and if you go back earlier in the century, when the mill first got going, you had these conditions that that are so similar to, to what we to what we are experiencing today, with all these workers working for way less than they're worth, uh, working crazy hours, working just incredibly high productivity demands, um, working for owners that are just, you know, living lives of just incredible plutocratic excess. Uh, one of the the owners of the of the of the mill back then had this. Um, the largest residence in New York City, this crazy um, mansion in New York City. And then he also had an entire village out in Pennsylvania that was built to, to resemble a, a French peasant village. He, this was just this crazy whim that he had. So he was just, and then all these other executives at, at Beth Steele back then were, were among the highest paid in the country. You had this incredible inequality between owners and the workers. Um, and, and then over time, of course, and you also just had very difficult work conditions, very dangerous work conditions. Um, over time, it took decades, it took decades of efforts, but finally in late 1941, um, Sparrows Point is unionized, Beth Steele is unionized, um, and which had a lot to do with World War II and the pressures on the company to, to allow a vote there, but they got unionized. And so you saw this dramatic increase in pay, far more, uh, worker self-determination on the job, far more say on the job. The jobs suddenly become much more sustainable, middle-class, family-supporting, career-supporting kind of jobs. They're still very dangerous um, jobs, no question. Um, and we have to be careful not to idealize them too much. Um, but they are jobs that a lot of men, and they're mostly men, of course, find find not just, um, not just you know, uh, financial work, in, but, um, and you know, very well paid, enough to support family, but also a real sense of meaning and identity and camaraderie with each other. Fast forward now, work the mill vanishes, right? Just gets wiped off the face of the earth. It is stunning if you, you know, if anyone who went down there last decade or two as it was being dismantled to see this entire skyline just gone. Um, you drive around there and your GPS in your car still calls out the old street names of the old town. I mean, it's eerie. And for people who used to work there, it's heartbreaking. And, and now it's been replaced by this incredible um, you know, logistics business park with now three Amazon warehouses. And we're kind of back to square one where you have workers once again, making not what they're worth, working cr crazy hours, crazy productivity demands with a plutocratic owner who in this case doesn't have a French peasant village, but he did just buy a $200 million yacht with another yacht to go along with it to, because his girlfriend's helicopter needs to be able to land on the smaller yacht or right? something like that. Um, and he's the richest man in the world. And he made $58 billion more last year. Um, and there is no union. We're back to that sort of square one. The work is less dangerous than the mill work, no question, but it's very physically strenuous. 
Um, and it also, and, and, and there's also, it's also much less well paid than the work at the mill was in, in its later years. Workers feel much less sense of purpose and camaraderie. It's one reason why workers barely last a year on average there. Um, and I tell this whole story through a man who spent 30 years working at the mill. Then after the mill closed, he went back to work at Amazon driving a forklift. And he lasted only a couple of years at the warehouse because he found the work just so, um, so completely unsatisfying. Also not well paid, of course, but just unsatisfying, lonely, isolated. Um, and after a couple of years, he, he, he walked out. Since you just brought him up, I'll ask this question now. We were you were the person you're talking about is Bill Bo Badani, if I'm pronouncing that name correctly. So, sure. how did you find these people? What were your research methods here? How did you have a, a lot of people here who symbolize all of these problems in this new economy? How do you find these people? And when you found them, were they willing to talk to you about what? for most of them was a traumatic part of their lives. So I, there are the, the people are really are at the core of the book and, and they are um, all, I find them all just very deeply fascinating figures. And, and I found them in different ways. Some of them I had actually came across in my national reporting before I set out to write the book. So for instance, there's a young man who makes cardboard boxes in Dayton, Ohio, which really kind of puts him at the very bottom of this whole ecosystem that stretches all the way from the cardboard box maker up to Jeff Bezos at the top. I met him while I was working on a documentary about Dayton for PBS um, and just discovered what a fascinating young man he was and, and how compelling he and his family were. And, and that's sort of how he made it into the, made it into the book. Um, in the case of Bill Bodani, um, I, I have actually Bill Barry to thank for helping me meet uh, meet, meet Bo. Bill's, uh, you know, former uh, labor professor at at CCBC at the Community College of Baltimore County, a figure known to many many here in Baltimore, who has very strong strong ties to the Beth Beth Steele retiree community. And I asked uh, Bill if um, if he might know any any retired Beth Steele workers whose grandsons grandchildren now worked in Amazon. So I thought it might be nice to sort of show that generational arc. So Bill invites me to a luncheon, uh, Beth Steele, the monthly luncheon of Beth Steele retirees out in Dundalk. And, um, and we ask if anyone there happens to have a grandson or granddaughter now working at Amazon. And after the lunch, up walks this gentleman in his late 60s. And he says, you're looking for someone who work at, works at Amazon? I said, yeah. He said, me, I do. I thought, you? Now you're not you? And, and he said, yeah, I drive a forklift there. Um, and, and then, you know, we, we proceeded to speak for over several months about his, his life. While we, while we were speaking with each other, he decided to leave the job because it was just too, too, too grueling and too, too depressing. Um, and, um, but yeah, there's a lot of, when you're doing a book like this, there's a lot of serendipity involved, of course, or you hope for serendipity. And that was one of those serendipitous moments. And... Given your um, reporting and your research here, we know, especially here in the Baltimore, D.C. area, that life is going to change once Amazon opens up its second headquarters in Crystal City over in Arlington. So given what you know about how Seattle has changed because of Amazon's presence there, what can you say we should expect in the DC Baltimore area as far as a change when Amazon fully opens its second headquarters here? Oh, it's just gonna be, it's gonna be extraordinary. I mean, you're gonna have, um, you're gonna have, first of all, we're right there at Crystal City, you're gonna have this complete transformation of what's now been this, you know, somewhat sort of underpopulated um, kind of office district um, turned turn into something that resembles, very strongly resembles what you now have in Seattle. The headquarters in South Lake Union, which is the neighborhood just, just north of downtown Seattle, that has been completely taken over by Amazon, where you have this whole kind of urban corporate campus with 40,000 or so Amazon employees. Um, and it's just, it is, it's a surreal place to be. Um, you, um, you have just so much, just this, just to have, there's such an incredible concentration of, of high paid tech workers. Um, also lots of dogs because Amazon's very welcoming to dogs. So you have all these people walking around, um, you know, with Bluetooths and dogs 
and then up in you have little odd touches like up on the 17th story of one building, you have um, a terrace, a large terrace with a beautiful view of downtown Seattle. That is a dog, it's a, it's a dog park uh, outdoors uh, on the 17th story balcony, um, just, just for dogs with this incredible view. Um, and, then, and then meanwhile, alongside that, that incredible prosperity and, and, and sort of success and dynamism of, of the Amazon campus, you have this astonishing inequality where you just have some of the worst homelessness in the country. Seattle ranks right behind San Francisco for levels of homelessness. You have dramatic displacement of longtime residents, especially that, that historic black neighborhood that I mentioned earlier, the Central District, which has just been transformed really to the point of unrecognizability um, and, and erasure, full erasure. These things are already happening in Washington, of course. They've already been happening for, for some years. Washington has had incredible displacement. The, 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 the rise of prosperity and wealth in Washington, which I talk about a lot in the book, has just caused almost unprecedented displacement on the uh, gentrification um, on le levels, you know, that it's hard to find, you know, matches for in the, around, the, around the country. 20,000, by one count, 20,000 black residents displaced in Washington just in the last decade or so um, by, the rising, by, by the rising wealth and unaffordability. Um, so what you're gonna, what you're gonna see with Amazon coming in with that incredible surge of, of money and high paid jobs. And you're gonna see a, a huge exacerbation of that effect of displacement, the homelessness, the unaffordability. And then about well, Baltimore, well, so, and then that gap is gonna grow just ever wider with, with this other city 40 miles up the road to the point where you can't help but wonder why are we doing it like this? The fact that um, one, one of the sort of key scenes in the book um, you have the scene where um, demolished homes, we, as we know, hundreds and hundreds of Baltimore homes are being demolished um, every year, and bricks from those homes are are being um, are being thankfully you know saved and not just tossed in the landfill, but saved and cleaned up and sold for reuse. And one of the big buyers of those bricks are are developers and renovators down in down in Washington and. And so we have now a situation, think about this, we have a situation where these two cities just 40 miles apart. In one city, you've got row homes going for eight, nine hundred thousand dollars $100,000, million dollars. Very few people can afford them. That's gonna get even worse. Just up the road, we're demolishing very similar homes by the hundreds and thousands. And then we're taking the bricks from the one city down to the other city to kind of give a faux historic facade to some of the kind of developments down in the other city. Um, that's completely out of whack, that there's something wrong in that picture. And the book is very much about that, that kind of out of whackness. How do we let things get so off kilter, um, so unhealthy, so unworkable for both sorts of cities? Now, your book is not about politics, but it's almost impossible not to read this book and relate it to what we saw in the last couple of presidential elections and all of the talk about, um, about people being left behind, people being frustrated with the way the country's going. Um, relate to us how this book and what you found has affected the way we look at politics, the way we look at rural versus urban politics, or can we make that connection? Are we, are we making the wrong connection here? No, we absolutely can, um, and, and there are definitely moments in the books in the book where this, where I implicitly or not so implicitly, kind of get at the, the sort of the Trump result of of, the, of these of of these disparities. Um, I've always I covered the 2016 election very closely. I was out in Ohio a lot that year, in Pennsylvania, other places, and and I always thought that this debate about that, that sprung up right as after the election, after Trump's win, about you know what was this was this about economic anxiety or racism um, and xenophobia? I always thought that that, that debate was frustratingly um, sort of oversimplified, and that in fact it was all tied up together. And that you know as I put it in the in the book, um, economic resentment and decline does not excuse racism and xenophobia. It weaponizes it. It makes makes voters more vulnerable to such ugly appeals. Um, 
And, and that is what you saw in 2016. Um, what the, the, the dynamic, the, the, one of the dynamics you have happening in, in parts of Ohio and elsewhere in the Midwest um, or Appalachia is, is, this, is places that used to be very heavily democratic. Um, now seeing the democratic party become more and more dominated which it has by these winner take all cities where the democratic party's base now really increasingly resides in the DCs and New York's and Boston, San Francisco, San Francisco's and LA and Seattle's so those places, um, you know, just look at the, where the you know, Democrats get, get their biggest support and also much of, much of their, their financial support um, that is increasingly the face of the party and, and voters in those more sort of working class, middle-class communities, in the Midwest and elsewhere, former Democratic voters or, or folks whose parents were Democrats look at, at that face of the party and they think that's not that's not me. Like I, I'm so far from that kind of prosperity um, in that world. And, and they start to look for a new home. And the Republican Party for a long time was not the most natural new home because the Republican Party was also, you know, very kind of country club and Mitt Romney-ish. Um, but then, then Trump comes along and and offers this um, with those kind of those ugly, some of those ugly appeals um, as sort of a special kind of hook, I guess, offers sort of a new home for these these homeless former Democrats. And and there, so there, that that dynamic absolutely played a part. That that resentment that that resentment of if you're in a place that has that it used to be prosperous and you, and, and you still see the ghosts of that all around you. You see those old Victorian homes that used to be where the factory owners used to live or you know, the, the, the house that your grandfather had that you haven't been able to keep up. And, you, and then you see you know, the, down, the main street just emptying out and you see everything just declining, declining, declining from what it used to be. And then you look and you see just you know, these glim dazzling coastal cities that now where so much of our wealth is now concentrated. And those cities are now the democratic cities. You're going to end up with this kind of alienation and resentment that is going to help drive you away from the Democratic Party. Um, so that's that's how I sort of made sense of that political dynamic. Are you arguing <laughs> that Amazon is bad for America, or that we just need to realize the effect that the Amazon economy is having on America? That's a, that's a very that's a very good question, and of course that's um, something that that in a way that kind of touches on the response I've gotten from Amazon. I was of course speaking to the company all through the last year, and their main um, their main response to me was, "Look, we we know that um, we know that these jobs are not ideal. These warehouse jobs are tough. They're under not well paid. Um, we um, but." And you know that ideally the, our economy would would be giving people a different kind of um, you know different kind of existence than that more, more more sort of higher a higher kind of better paid existence. But look, there are all these larger forces that are working on us as a country that haven't for years. Technology, e-commerce, globalization. Um, if it were not us in this role, this incredibly dominant role. Um, it would be someone else. Um, it would be some other company named something else. It just happens to be us. Um, and, and I do think that there's something to that to some degree, that there are, there are of course larger systemic forces acting on us in our economy. But I'm also a really firm believer in, in, um, in responsibility and personal responsibility and personal agency and corporate agency. And the fact is that, that while there are these larger things at work, the company has made specific decisions over the years that have exacerbated these dynamics, that have made them even worse. They've been especially aggressive in seeking tax, avoiding taxes um, at every level of you know, government um, and society. They've been, they're, they're especially aggressive in their, in their demands of workers in the warehouses. As we saw just this week, when a new report came out showing that their warehouse work injuries are higher rates than other warehouses. And, and it was their decision to put that second headquarters in Washington, D.C., in what was already the wealthiest metro area in the country. Just think if they had decided to put that second headquarters in a, in a St. Louis, in a Cleveland, or Baltimore, 
just how that with one fell swoop, you would have made some kind of big difference toward some kind of rebalancing um, of this off, off kilterness in our country. But as this former Amazon investor um, uh, put it to me, um, who's since kind of broken with the company, and Nick Hanauer, he said, look, that's simply not how the company thinks. They're not thinking about the national, what's sort of best for the country, what's best for our society. That simply doesn't enter into it. They're thinking about what is best for the company. And they decided what was best for the company was to go to Washington, DC, because you had the skilled workforce there. And this is the other thing I mentioned before, alluded to before, they also wanted to be near the federal government because the federal government right now is their biggest threat. Their biggest threat is not another company. Um, the biggest threat is that the federal government is going to somehow intervene, break them up, rein them in. And so what better way to fend them off than to put your second headquarters at the seat of the federal government, um, so kind of a, envelop this, the federal government in a kind of soft power. Um, and that, so that's one, another reason why they decided to go there. So I would say that this whole Amazon competition, looking at all of these other smaller cities, or perhaps even New York, wasn't a real competition at all? In, you know, in hindsight, it looks like we were all taken for a huge ride. I mean, it was this massive, right? It was this massive spectacle. We had endless media stories about it. All these cities put in their applications for it. 238 cities and towns put in applications for that big prize. They spent all this money, all this time. I know Baltimore just spent endless all-nighters preparing their bid. They were so hopeful um, for it. And then in the end, it turns out that the two most obvious winter cities on the East Coast get the, get the prize, DC and New York. The New York one kind of blows up in the end. So it ends, you end up just with DC. Um, and it was, it was just, it really does seem in hindsight as if it was some kind of really bad joke. And, and, and the company got out of it all sorts of publicity. And also they got all this data from all these cities, all this data sort of basically, essentially showing what cities would be willing to, to give up um, at the negotiating table uh, when it comes to any kind of future siting decisions. Well, at this point, I'm going to start working in some of the questions from our audience. Remember, if you have questions, put them in the comments section on Facebook or put it in the chat here on Zoom and I'll work them into our conversation. Since we're literally, we're just talking about New York City, one of the questions we have Said, wants to know if you can speak to the New York City experience uh, and with their experience with Amazon. I think that there was significant community pushback leading to Am Amazon backing out and heading to Arlington. Is that what happened with New York City, or were they were there ever were they was there ever anyone really in the running outside of D.C. given what we know about Amazon? No, I mean New York was absolutely that they were the second choice. It was they were going to. Um, split the prize. I mean, it was right from the start, it was a little bit weird that Amazon, after having offered 50,000 jobs to a single city, decided now that they were going to split it between these two cities, 25,000 each. Um, but New York was there, it was going to be in Queens, Long Island City. And anybody who had this massive backlash in New York, um, much stronger than what you saw in, in DC, partly because the subsidies that New York State and city were offering were even larger than the ones that Virginia was offering in Arlington, just huge subsidies to Amazon to, to come for, even, the, even though they were such a wealthy company, even though they clearly wanted to come to New York no matter what, they were the government was gonna give them these massive handouts. Um, so big backlash over that. You also had the, you had the in existence of a real kind of, you know, activist left in New York led by um, uh, AOC and, and, and others in New York that, that sort of served to, to kind of lead a pushback in a way that you didn't have in DC and Virginia. And then it, finally, you had this very interesting dynamic involving unions. Um, there, as, as this kind of resistance started to bubble up in New York, um, New York officials essentially said to Amazon, look, we're getting all this pushback. Could you at least promise to we're going to give you these huge tax incentives, but could you at least promise that you're going to be fair and relatively hands off when it comes to possible union organizing, not at the headquarters, but at the at your existing warehouses? There are these huge warehouses in Staten Island, and there was already a lot of union ferment there, and and so the officials, Democratic officials, said, could you at least just be decent with that in as you 
are dealing with that union effort there. And, and Amazon basically at that point said, we're out of here. That, that was a bridge too far for them. That was the moment where it actually all fell apart. And, and they just, you know, basically called up Andrew Cuomo and said, sorry, um, you know, uh, don't look a gift horse in the mouth, in the mouth, we're out of here. And then, and so then it just fell back to just DC. So what, what was the major differences between the, what they were saying in Virginia versus what they were saying in the, in, in New York city? Is there, did Virginia just give away the store to get Amazon down, down, down to Virginia or was Virginia, what was left after New York city said, we're not, we said, we, 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 we want you to do this and we're, we're not going to take it without it. No, Virginia actually, so Virginia all along was, was going to be one of the two date. And they had actually, interestingly, they had not given up as much in terms of tax incentives. They had, um, they had, um, it was quite a lot, but nowhere near as much as New York had offered. Um, I also, I, I conjecture in the book um, whether one element of the difference, that this is a little touchy. I, I used to work at the Washington Post and I have many, many you know, colleagues, great colleagues who still work there. But one difference in the two, uh, two different places is that you, are, you, had the, you had the New York Times right off the bat writing pretty critically about the, about the Amazon bid there, um, Amazon headquarters there and what it would mean and all the subsidies and all that. And the Washington Post has in general, Amazon, the Washington Post has in general been quite good about covering Amazon in other aspects of the company. Um, they, they had a good piece just this week on the workplace injuries in the warehouses. But this whole story of Amazon's incredible takeover of Washington, um, which is goes far beyond the headquarters. It's also the massive increase in lobbying by Amazon in Washington and Jeff Bezos buying the post and 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 the um, buying this big mansion in Washington and sort of turning it into this kind of salon, power salon, all these huge federal contracts that the company's seeking for its for its cloud services. There's been an incredible kind of takeover of, Am of Washington by Amazon. And that story now capped by HQ2, by the second headquarters. And that story has definitely been a tricky story for the newspaper owned by Jeff Bezos to, to tell. And I, think, and I think we just have to reckon with that, that, that this is a tough, this is tough for the, for the Washington Post. And, um, and, and it's possible that that was one reason why you saw less, um, less of a kind of immediate pushback. And here's another <laughs> story, audience question. Um, first of all, they want you to know that they want to thank you for your great work. And they say, I've always speculated that when Amazon makes a promise of jobs and returns for tax breaks, that the company already has plans and work for the next wave of technology to make the very jobs they are promising redundant. Do you have any evidence of this? And when I saw this question, I immediately thought of all these news stories I hear about Amazon drones delivering packages, which would eliminate the drivers. Right. Yeah, I mean, the, the tax giveaways for the warehouses are so confounding. And Baltimore, you know, was right there back in 2014 when the first warehouse came in on Browning Highway at the GM plant. They gave, I think it was 43 million, the city and the state gave to Amazon for that warehouse. And what's so confounding about it is that the company now needs to be just about everywhere with its warehouses. It's promising one two-day delivery. It has to be everywhere. It can't, if you if a given city or state says, no, we're not going to give you tens of millions of subsidies, they're not, they can't go to the next state. They got to be everywhere. And so cities and towns have more leverage than they realize, but nonetheless, they keep giving up these subsidies. As far as the robots go, I mean, the, the warehouses keep getting more and more automated. And the, the biggest shift in them in the last few years has been this incredible move from what you used to have, which I think we all know that image of the picker in the Amazon warehouse, walking up and down all those aisles, endless miles a day, looking for items that, that, that have been ordered and pulling them off the shelves. Um, that person in most warehouses has now been replaced by robots. You have these incredible robots, they're called the Kivas, K-I-V-A, and they zoom around, they got stacks of shells on them, and they zoom around, somehow manage not to crash into each other, and they bring the, the given item to the picker who's standing in place in a fixed location and simply pulling things off the shelves as they are brought to him or her by the robot. Um, so you've had that big shift, but what, but the, one of the reasons that there's still so many workers in these warehouses and why they had to hire 400,000 more people last year 
to deal with our incredible surge in, in orders during the pandemic is that the one thing that they haven't been able to teach the robots how to do yet is grab things. It's really hard to teach robots how to grab things. Um, and things of different sizes and weights. We as humans are good at that. We can, you know, we've got our, our thumbs and we and we can sort of adjust to the, the item. It's hard for robots to do that. And so for the time being, until they can figure out how to teach robots to grab, they still need thousands and thousands of workers in the warehouses. Um, and, you know, of course, who knows you know what will what will come of that, but for the time being, you're seeing Amazon just continuing to ramp up its hiring by a lot um, because we are just ordering more and more and more stuff from them. The one question <laughs> I didn't get a chance to ask before we got into the public questions was your experience writing this book during a pandemic. That was when Amazon sales really went through the roof because we were all stuck at home. We we didn't want to go out to stores which made Amazon a godsend to many people because they could just order it online and have an Amazon driver drop it off at, 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 at his, his or her door. How did the pandemic change any of this or did the pandemic change anything and Amazon's just marching on? It just, it ramps it up incredibly. I had no idea, of course, when I started this book three years ago that you were going to end up with Amazon being this much more dominant and powerful um, because of the pandemic. Uh, we always, a lot of us, I think, always had kind of a ambivalence about ordering from Amazon, some felt feeling of guilt, and now it's, you had this approval almost to, to go ahead and order from Amazon. Um, you it was not just no longer you didn't was didn't just have to not feel guilt anymore. You can almost feel kind of virtue in ordering from Amazon. So you have this huge surge, and and it, with the surge did play into. And I just saw a good question come up about the the the, the union vote in, in Alabama, which happened just after you know my. Um, my book came out, but the there's no question that that the surge in work in the warehouse, making things so much more intense and demanding in the warehouses, and also the worry about catching COVID in the warehouses, has created some real um, ferment in the warehouses among workers, and 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 some real has sort of ratcheted up the discontent among workers. And of course, it was not enough to to actually carry a majority vote in the warehouse in Alabama. Um, I think the reason for that is twofold. One is that there's just, the laws are so slanted against organizing right now in this country. They happen for decades. It's why we have so little unionization left in America. Amazon has, knows all the tricks to, to dissuading workers against, um, against voting to join a union. And then I think the second reason is a broader one, which is that workers now have just gotten such lower expectations for themselves that, that the notion that you know, oh, here's this union that's going to give you a raise up your job and make it more sort of meaningful and something you can stay at longer. A lot of workers at these warehouse jobs are not thinking of these jobs that way. They're just a job to do for now. They're just going to stay only a year or so. Um, 15 bucks, hey, it's better than fast food, it's better than minimum wage. It's just something that we can do for now. It's not something you're seeking to stay with or to build some meaning around. Um, so that's a real challenge for the organizers, but I don't think the fight is not over. We have to keep in mind it took decades to organize Sparrow's Point, and and it's probably going to take decades to organize the warehouses. We've been talking a lot about Amazon, but one of our questions here is: the dynamic the same or different for other large corporations such as Under Armour or Exelon? Very good question. The our economy in general is becoming much more concentrated um, just across various sectors. It's one reason why the antitrust debate in Washington is now such an important one. Um, Amazon is Amazon and the tech giants are, however, I think really something to themselves and the, the level of dominance they've, they've gotten, the level of wealth they've, they've, they've gotten. The, the, you really have to almost think back to the early days of the 20th century, back to the examples of Standard Oil, some of those companies, to find a similar example of companies that essentially control both the platform and are competing against others on the platform. It's really kind of almost like the railroads and standard oil in that sense. Um, Walmart is of course another you know, huge retail company. We've all, we worried about them for decades, but one crucial difference between Walmart and Amazon, I have to say is for, well, two, one is that Amazon has created those, helped create the wealth at, in the winner take all cities like Seattle and DC in a way that Walmart never did. Walmart made its shareholders and the Walton family to very wealthy, but you didn't end up with that kind of winner take all city effect as a result of Walmart. It destroyed downtowns a lot of across the country, but it didn't 
produce that kind of winner take all city. Finally, Walmart does pay a lot more taxes than Amazon, not through any great virtue, but it's harder for Walmart to avoid paying federal income taxes than it is for Amazon. Walmart pays tens of millions more in taxes than, than does Amazon. Unfortunately, we're running out of time, but I'm see if I can squeeze one more great audience question in here. So Alec, they're wondering if, do you think this really is a matter of geography or a matter of the inability to mitigate the power imbalance between corporations and workers, including the decline of unions, corporate power to set low wages, and the basic capture of democratic institutions by corporate interests? Great question. I, I really have come to think of this as, as a sort of as a three-pronged problem it, it, with three different solutions. There's the problem of, of corporate power with workers. And that, that fight, as I mentioned with Bessemer, is going to continue. And it's probably going to mean somehow changing the laws to make to, to, to restore the balance between workers and corporations and employers and make it easier to organize. Second, you have the, 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 the regional problem, which for me is deeply tied to monopoly. The one, one thing the book tries to do is show that the problem of regional inequality in this country is tied to the problem of monopoly and that, that the concentration of wealth in certain places in this country is tied to the concentration of the economy in certain companies. And that if we can break, if you can somehow break up that concentration in the economy, it'll somewhat help with the regional problem. And then the third one, third prong is something I think sort of for all of us. It, there's definitely a consumer aspect to this. The book tries to show you what is behind that easy one click, that convenience of the one click. Um, and it does, you know, without moralizing the subject, just hopefully I think encourage people, all of us to, um, to adopt a different approach, not to be, not to go cold turkey, not to you know, necessarily boycott the company or anything like that, but to, to think more about what's behind the one click and to as much as possible, try to return to the physical world around us, supporting local businesses around us. Going, getting out of the house after this pandemic year, getting back to the library, getting back to the movies, movies, getting back to the theater, just re-engaging with the world around us because otherwise, if we're not out there supporting the places we live in, in all these different ways, supporting that physical world, that community, it will wither. And the book is sort of showing you what happens um, with that withering and what a bleak, bleak future it really is. Well, we'd like to thank again, Alec McGillis for being here tonight and with us and talking to us about fulfillment, winning and losing in one click America. Alec, thank you so much for writing this wonderful book and thanks for taking time out of your busy schedule to talk to us about the book tonight. Great read, everybody out there, go get your own copy. Thanks, Jesse, such great questions. Thank you, Jesse, and thank you, Alec. Thank you so much for joining us this evening, everyone. Closed captioning has been enabled. Please post your questions in the chat. Oh, I think I'm reading the wrong piece here. I apologize. I would like to thank to Alex and Jesse for taking the time to be with us today and to the Baltimore Museum of Industry for your partnership. Thank you for the Hearing and Speech Agency for providing accessibility. And thank you all in the audience for joining us. We also appreciate it if you felt the survey posted a few minutes ago. Take care and have it and stay safe. Thank you, everyone.